welcome to another video in the series Archaeology and Islam. My name is Dan Gibson and if you have a question you'd like to ask you can email me at the email address at the bottom of your screen dan at canbooks.ca. In the film The Sacred City I made a statement that I have searched ancient maps and never once have I found Mecca mentioned before 800 AD. It's not on ancient maps. I still stand by that statement, but it did cause a reaction. I've received many emails and some folks have gone as far as to create YouTube videos to answer me. However, back in 2013, I wrote a paper on this very subject. And so in this video we want to explore their claims and I hope I can explain to you why I still stand by that opinion that Mecca is not on any early maps. All of the information I give in this video can be found in the paper Suggested Solutions for Issues Concerning the Location of Mecca in Ptolemy's Geography, which I wrote in 2013. You can find this paper on the internet, uh, on the web, at thesacredcity.ca. Now, first, everyone who has written to me on this point, and every film made so far to refute me about ancient maps, uses the same information. To date, no one has come forward with a newly discovered map that contains the name Mecca. Instead, people come forward with the same old maps and they point to this city or to that city and they claim it's really Mecca but it has a different name. So no one has found a map that has the name Mecca on it. It's always some other name. The most common name is Mecorba but some point to Centos Villa and others point to Thebe and say this is Mecca. However, they have no other evidence except that these towns are on old maps they're in the middle of Arabia and even though they're beside the uh, Betius River they still claim how well, this is Mecca on the shores of a river now there are some misunderstandings about these old maps everywhere I go people assume that they are all different maps they all look different they're all drawn by different people at different times, sometimes centuries apart. For example, here is a map drawn in 1467. And here is a map drawn in 1478. And here is a map drawn in 1516. And another map from 1595. And here is one from 1720. And the list goes on and on. These maps all look different, but actually they're all the same. All of them have something in common. All of them mention that they are after Ptolemy, or labeled Ptolemaeus, Claudius, or just Claudius. What does this mean? Even though the maps were drawn in the 1400s and the 1500s, they are all based on information from Claudius Ptolemy. He was a geographer who lived in Alexandria around 90 to 160 AD, about 400 years before Islam. While he drew many maps, his greatest accomplishment was a globe, a round globe on which he noted many places. However, his maps and his globes did not survive. All we have today is his book, The Geography which lists cities and some features along with his own system of latitude and longitude. The geography is composed of eight books with a first volume explaining the method behind the system he uses and then volumes two to seven containing lists of locations and their coordinates and then the last volume that gives the 26 regions known in his day. Now around the beginning of the 15th century his works were rediscovered and translated from Greek into Latin and it sparked the idea of a global coordinate system 
That revolutionized European geographical thinking. Starting in 1477 until as late as 1560s, uh, people were drawing maps based on Ptolemy and the coordinates that Ptolemy left us from his three-dimensional globe. Starting in 1561, Gastaldi and a host of others began to make little corrections on Ptolemy's maps. And they began to change the map slowly, but all of them still say based on Ptolemy. Because at that time, more British uh, explorers were coming back, and the British began to develop their own system of latitude and longitude that was different from what Ptolemy used. Now, all of the maps that people use to protest my statements have been drawn using the information that Ptolemy provides for us. Each map maker drew his own map, but the names and the positions all came from Ptolemy, and they're often labeled Ptolemyus Claudius. I have also examined maps made with the Arabic system of Kiyas and Isba and uh, Tafila and so forth, and they give the measurements in Isba, and they're measuring from the North Star. Under the Chias system, the world was divided into 224 isba, or 224 degrees, not 360, which is what the West uses. We took it from the Babylonians. Then there are maps made in the modern system of latitude and longitude. This was developed by the British in 1714. And it's based on uh, the town of Greenwich in the UK, and it uses 360 degrees around the world. Many books are written on this subject. So we end up with three systems, three different ways of looking at the world. We have uh, Ptolemy's maps that are based on um, 81 degrees north, uh, from, uh, and north and south and 360 degrees east and west. And he drew a map uh, of only 180 degrees. We have the Arab maps. And they are based on 240 degrees all the way around the world. A complete different system of, uh, of numbers all the way around the world. And then we have our modern system based on 360 degrees all the way around the world. So as you can see, it's not going to be easy to move data back and forth between these systems. You can't just take Ptolemy's map and stick it onto a modern map. You have to look at the coordinates that Ptolemy is giving us. Now today, few scholars accept Ptolemy's coordinates as accurate. The value of his coordinates has been contested by many scholars, and a lot of arguing has taken place over the years. Lots of academic discussion on these maps. Now, there's a lot of reasons for this. Ptolemy, first of all, he calculated the circumference of the Earth as 28,985 kilometers. It was a massive error, nearly 28% wrong. But his circumference was used in Europe for over 400 years. That's one of the problems with the maps that we're going to look at. He got his circumference of the world wrong. He measured also only from the equator up to the polar circle, and he had 81 degrees in that time, from deep in Africa up to the Arctic Circle. Different system of measurement. And uh, he put longitude and latitude. He started in the Canary Islands as zero, and he went over to 180 degrees in China, because that's the world that he knew about. And so all of his calculations are there, but since they made the world too small, all of his calculations are wrong. This was perhaps one of the major reasons why Columbus thought he could sail across the Atlantic Ocean to China, because he understood from Ptolemy's maps that the world was much smaller than it really was. Now, since Ptolemy never visited most of the sites, he had to rely on merchants and sailors to give him descriptions. Many of the places he mentioned were plotted very poorly because he didn't know the exact location, and so he rounded most of them to the nearest degree, which is quite a system when you have only 180 from the Canary Islands all the way out to China. And then he has many mistakes and inventions told to him by merchants and travelers. Rivers in Arabia, for example. Ptolemy, who was desperate for information of every place in the world, he got his information from whoever he could find. And they came. Sometimes the information was misleading. Sometimes it was fanciful. Sometimes it was just wrong. Another problem is that many of the names Ptolemy lists 
are obscured because they are written as the Greeks knew them or heard them, not as they might have been called in their original language. Since the Greeks did not have all the sounds of all the other languages, uh, many sounds were lost. So imagine a Greek sailor hearing an Arab telling him of a place, and that sailor later, some years later, meets Ptolemy, and then he tries to remember what that other sailor told him, tries to pronounce the city. The chances of getting it right are kind of slim. Another issue with Ptolemy is that he, he, in his, he uses a globe, but the map makers were drawing on a flat surface. So each of the maps produced from Ptolemy's coordinates looked slightly different because each map maker had a different picture in his mind. Today, it's common for people simply to look at the maps drawn in the 14th and 15th centuries and imagine, well, which names match the modern names rather than comparing the names, the descriptions, and the degrees of, the, of Ptolemy's latitude and la, la, longitude and trying to understand what was Ptolemy actually referring to. Now, back in 2012 and 2013, I spent considerable time working on Ptolemy's maps, his maps of Felix Arabia. I had to do, examine many other locations with a mathematician and a computer program. He developed a computerized model and a mathematical algorithm that would allow me to translate data from Ptolemy's map into a modern latitude and longitude. Now, early in this process, we began to understand that Ptolemy's latitude is quite stable, uh, but his longitude coordinates uh, show that he slowly stretched his map out towards the east. So it's not exactly one over the other. He didn't quite understand how things fit. And so some places become bigger than others. And he divided his descriptions of Arabia then into three separate maps. He's pretty accurate in Arabia Patria because the Romans traveled there. He could get lots of information. He does a fairly decent job on Arabia Felix, which is down in Yemen and an important place for trade. But Ptolemy has trouble with Arabia Deserta. He lists only 50 places compared to over 200 in the others. So when we look at this, we have to begin to look at what can we use to judge? How can we tell things? One of the secrets is to look at the, ra uh, the rivers in Arabia. And that's one of the problems when we try to equate Mecca with Markoba or Sentos or Thabia, is there is this Batius River in which Ptolemy tells us flows through this section. And it's a problem for modern geographers as well, because there's no active river systems anywhere in Arabia today. But Ptolemy clearly marks the mouth of this river on the Arabian coast just south of Thabi, as well as two rivers running into the Indian Ocean and one river running into the Persian Gulf. Now the existence of these rivers have cast some doubt on the accuracy of Ptolemy's maps. But as I have traveled throughout all of Arabia, I have begun to realize our, these rivers are key to understanding the, what he's speaking about. They're very important. Over time, the names of cities and villages change. Ru they become ruins and they crumble and are lost. But river courses, uh, they may change a bit, but they are still there. And there's evidence of where the river was flowing before. And so I believe the rivers give us a bridge between Ptolemy's book and the globe that we know it today. So on the map, you will see the Batius River is clearly marked just south of Sentos and Thebe. Ptolemy clearly marks these places as coastal locations, not inland, as some have imagined. He has separate lists and he provides a list of names of places on the coast and he provides a list of names inland. Markoba is listed as inland while Sentos and Thebe are clearly listed as coastal locations. If we're going to locate these cities, we must understand where the Batius River is located. We get the Batius River right, and that will help us to get the rest of the map right. Now, the earliest descriptions we have for this coastland come from the Periplus Maris Ethria, which is an ancient book that was written. It makes no reference to any rivers or ports in Central Arabia along the coast. This was written in the first century AD before Ptolemy made his map. No rivers are mentioned along that coast and no major ports. The Batius River 
appears on all the maps after Ptolemy using uh, modern maps we realize the river is not in the right place and so what are we going to do well as we will demonstrate Ptolemy imagined Arabia Felix to be larger than it was so he located it too far north and uh, we most of it is down in the south and uh, the Batius River will help us as we look at it because it comes out of the mountains. It comes out from Yemen down to al Luheya on the Red Sea coast. If we find this, it looks like here is what he is drawing. Uh, we can now see the mountains and the coast and we can see the islands that correspond to Ptolemy's map just off of it. Now the Tahama is a broad flat stretch of sand that separates the mountains of Arabia from the sea coast and Wadi Mawar flows through a clearly defined riverbed across that sandy area and it empties into the Red Sea near the ancient town of al Luhia. Just below the river and in the interior, Ptolemy tells us, is the region of Sabai or Saba, the region which grew myrrh. This helps us confirm that the Batius River is Wadi Mawar and it's located just north of the Saba region. Now, I personally traveled through this area in the 1980s, and uh, the area was all flat, and the wadi flows from the mountains into the Red Sea. In the photo, you can see why sailors might have imagined a river was flowing out in this point, because it was a, a dry wadi bed. When it rains, though, water does come down and flow into the Red Sea. And so this... Uh, clearly helps us understand uh, why he labeled this the islands of Jazen are off the coast uh, there and their wadi comes down and so forth and the Ptolemy maps uh, point and uh, what we're looking at there I believe is al Luhea, but that's only one river so we need to move on to the next river and Ptolemy identifies the mouth of this next river he calls it the Prianus River and it's on the Yemeni coast. Now here is Wadi Dahawan, and notice how it appears on the coast. It's right near this town, and you can see sailors going by would look up and see where this flows in and think there's a river there. Ptolemy also lists the Hormus River as flowing into the Indian Ocean. Today, Wadi Ben Khaled uh, flows down. Uh, this is in Oman. It's near El Jumeila, and uh, it flows down into the ocean, dry most of the year. Ptolemy, I believe, identified that as a river. The last river is what he calls the Laris River. It's on the north side of Arabia. It flows into the Persian Gulf North. And today that corresponds, I believe, with what is known as the creek in uh, this, uh, Dubai, the city of Dubai. And if you look down on the city of Dubai, you can clearly see the creek and where the ancient river flowed. So this gives us four rivers that will help us line up the Ptolemy's map with the actual map that uh, and the satellite photos that we have. Now there's a number of city locations on Ptolemy's map which are well known today. He correctly identifies the enemy ports of Musa and Aden and Cana and so forth and so we can we can identify those. When we attempt to overlay though these maps on his map over top of a modern map things don't fit. Notice there are cities in the ocean. Little seems to fit. So we're going to have to manipulate a little bit this map to see exactly what he's drawn. The solution to this was uh, to uh, use the rivers and line them up. Uh, so when we move the map so we get the rivers right. And in order to do this, we anchored Ptolemy's map using Hegra in the north. Remember we talked about Hegra in the last video? And so we recognize that Mochura in the north was also Yenbu, so we had two points we could anchor in the north of the map. And then we began to move the map around anchoring this, and uh, we could do this with the computer and manipulate it until we got all four rivers to fit. When we did this, many of the interior locations suddenly became apparent. Ptolemy's Sentos village becomes uh, Jazan. And Thebe town becomes Al Luhea. More than that, Makorba becomes Al Mahabisha. And uh, Mara then becomes Marib, which is where the great dam was that, uh, that uh, is important in Islamic history. So Datha becomes Sana. Safar becomes Zafar, modern day Zafar, on the Indian coast. 
Petros becomes Salala, and Mosa, Mosaha becomes uh, uh, Suharam. And uh, as we adjusted this, though, according to the river locations, the city coordinates started to make more sense as they began to line up. Obviously, Ptolemy grossly underestimated the size of the Nafu Desert in Saudi Arabia, and he allowed the locations of his map to drift north. And uh, because he made Yemen was important, so it became bigger than it was, and in his mind, the deserts in Saudi Arabia were smaller. So from this corrected map, we can easily discern what Ptolemy intended. We can also be quite safe to conclude that Mecca and Medina did not appear on any map based on Ptolemy. This would be in keeping with the archaeological record that shows that Medina was not settled as a significant urban area until the breaking of the Maghreb Dam around 570 AD, and that Mecca and Saudi Arabia was not settled as a city until after 700 AD. If you want more information, please visit the website on the screen and download the paper suggested solutions for issues concerning the location of Mecca and Ptolemy's geography. You can see Ptolemy's list, you can see all of his coordinates, you can see the maps and the pictures of what we did, and you can check out uh, how we view Ptolemy's maps. I'm Dan Gibson, and this has been another edition in the series Archaeology and Islam.